Okay, good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alice Hill, and I'm with the Kensington Conservancy. Um, if you've been to a couple of these webinars in the past, uh, you know that we're in for uh, some good information and some interesting talks. Um, I'm going to introduce Carter, who needs no introduction. He's been doing these webinars and doing a fabulous job with them. Um, we hope that you all are enjoying them and uh, will let us know of your interest. Um, I'm trying to take uh, the, the attendance as people log on. So that's why at times it, it goes kind of dead, but I hope to get everybody so we know who are the regulars and who would like to join us. Um, please feel free to ask any questions you have. And if you think of questions afterwards, please contact Carter or myself because we'd be happy to speak with you. Um, so tonight we're gonna do butterflies and moss. I know one goes to the other, <laughs> but Carter's gonna tell us more about it. And um, let's, uh, let's have at it then, Carter. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, I have put everyone on mute this evening just so that there's no background noise, but at the end of the presentation, feel free to unmute yourself for the question period. Um, in terms of butterflies and moths, I am by far, by no means an expert on either of the two um, types of insects, but I am an enthusiast for both of them. So I, in the last few years, I've learned a lot and I'm gonna share a little bit um, with you about what I know. There's way more information out there about butterflies and moths that I've still yet to learn, but um, this will just be a little bit of an introduction to the topic. I'm just gonna get my screen up here. So here we go, butterflies and moths of the St. Joseph Channel area. This is, um, all the pictures in this presentation tonight are ones that I've taken myself this is a bronze copper, a species of butterfly that I found near the Deborah boat launch last fall. It was pretty exciting. It was the first one at that time I'd seen one. So before we actually dive into butterflies and moths, just in case there's anyone here who is unaware of the Kensington Conservancy and what we do, our mission is the establishment, development, maintenance, and management of nature preserves and programs in the St. Joseph Channel. Um, area for the conservation and preservation of natural ecosystems. So we protect over 920 acres of ecologically sensitive land. Um, so we have about 12 nature preserves here in the St. Joseph Channel area. Um, over 900 species of plants and wildlife have been recorded on them. So there's lots of biodiversity in the area. We have a set of hiking trails called the Foster Parkland and Walking Trails that attract hundreds of hikers each year. Um, they're about four kilometers in length. They're pretty moderate. There's some ups and downs and rocky areas, but they're fun to hike. We also provide educational programming to the local community. And we like to do a lot of that with um, our youth in the area. So almost all of our operating budget is funded by private donations. We're a registered charity. So we rely on the generosity of our community to do the important conservation work that we do. And if you're interested, memberships are only $35 a year. So to start, um, the difference between butterflies and moths. Obviously, I'm sure most of you are aware of butterflies and moths and know that they look pretty similar. Um, but there are some differences here. Um, one joke that I often see on the internet and such is that butterflies are just moths, but with better PR people. So, um, which is often true actually. But, so here's a little graphic here that explains the differences between butterflies and moths. Um, there's a lot of exceptions to these kind of rules here, but for the most part, butterflies are active during the day and moths are active at night. It is pretty unusual to see a butterfly during the night, but there are lots of moths that you will find during the day out and about. Some of them are actually primarily active during the day, but um, that's just kind of one indicator. Um, when they land in the bottom corners there, you can see that butterflies generally land and have their wings upright together and uh, moths have their wings flat against the surface. This one is 
Um, there's a lot of exceptions to this rules. This rule, um, butterflies will often have their wings open, you know, basking in the sun or something like that. The antennas are really what you need to look at. Um, butterflies have slender antennas that have clubs on the end, while moths have these funny looking, hairy, feathery looking antennas. So those are the major differences um, that you can see when looking at um, the two. So I'm going to start with some stats. Stats are one of my favorite things. Um, these stats are taken from iNaturalist, which is the popular community science program. It's not 100% accurate. There's um, known observations that have not made their way into iNaturalist, especially the smaller scale you go. But it'll give you a good sense of the differences between um, numbers of species of the two. So butterflies, there's just over 10,000 worldwide. We have just under 300 in Canada, about 150 in Ontario. In the Algoma district, um, iNaturalist has 78 species, but I'm pretty sure there's 10 or so that have not made it onto iNaturalist. And we have recorded within the TKC focal area of the St. Joseph Channel that um, 51 different species. So moths, there's three to four times as many out there, um, almost 37,000. 3,000 of which are found in Canada, and almost all of those have also been found in Ontario. So on a naturalist, there's 436 species in the Algoma district and 78 for the TKC focal area. But I know those numbers are really low. Um, there's just not a lot of people out here recording moths and entering that data. It seems like every time I find a new moth that it's a first one for the Algoma district. So there's a lot um, of variety still left to discover there. Oh, that should say butterflies, my apologies. But I'm gonna start out by uh, going through some butterflies that you might be able to find around here. Fortunately, there's not gonna be enough time to go through the whole 70, 80 of them that are found. I haven't even seen all of them myself, so I don't have photos. But this one here is a white admiral. It's pretty distinct uh, black butterfly with large white um, bands on both um, wings. You'll likely see lots of these this summer if you're paying attention. Sorry, this also, I don't know why it says moths here. Technical difficulties, of course. But this is the much beloved monarch butterfly. Um, there are species at risk here in Ontario. They migrate annually from Mexico up to, um, up to our area here. That's a pretty long flight for such a delicate little insect. Um, they're, this is feeding on a dandelion. This is a photo I actually took a couple of nights ago, so they're back now. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone I'm sure knows what these are and are familiar with them. This one, some folks might be less familiar with, Viceroy. This one often gets mistaken for a monarch. But I'm gonna circle a little band here. This line is on the wing. And if we go back to the monarch, see that there's no band across all of those um, other bands. So that's one of, there's other subtle differences, but that's one of the main ones that you can recognize right away to determine between monarch and viceroy. Morning cloak. This is another pretty common butterfly. This is actually one of the species that overwinters locally as an adult. So it's often one of the first to emerge in the spring because um, they're already here, ready to go, ready to fly as soon as it gets warm enough. Canadian tiger swallowtail. This is another um, very pretty butterfly, bright yellow. You often see these guys um, feeding on the lilac bushes. So they've just actually started to come out um, within the last few days I've been seeing them, which I'm perfectly because the lilacs are out. Painted lady, this is another, well, they're all beautiful, but so I'm probably gonna be saying this a lot, but beautiful butterfly um, that, uh, you know, it's kind of hit and miss. Sometimes you see lots of them. Sometimes you don't see many, but they're around. This um, American lady, obviously very similar to the painted lady. The one way, to, uh, fairly quickly to tell what it is, is this um, American lady has two little white dots um, just past the black portions of the wings. 
And if we go back to the painted lady and circle the same spots, you'll see that those two white dots are not there. Appalachian brown. This is a relatively plain looking butterfly, but has these neat eye looking dots on its wings. Um, before I started getting into butterflies, there was only, I think, one or two records of Appalachian brown um, in the Algoma district, both of them kind of at St. Joseph Island. And in the last few years, I've been seeing them all over the place um, on St. Joseph Island, where I spend a lot of time, and on TKC properties. Um, so their population here is likely higher than we expected. So that's one of the benefits of having more eyes out looking for these butterflies and recording them. Another um, brown species, this one's called eyed brown, fairly similar. There's subtle differences in the colors and the lines, but these guys are pretty common in wetlands. Meadow fertility, another there seems to be a big orange theme in butterflies here, but uh, as their name suggests, these are found in meadows. I see lots of these in the, on our black hole preserve at the north end where it's you know, meadow-like habitat. Common ringlet, um, just one of the other neat butterflies. Green comma, there's actually, I think, three or four different species of comma that we get around here, all of them looking very, very similar. I haven't quite learned yet how to identify them perfectly. I rely a lot of help from the internet to a naturalist to identify them, but another orange butterfly. European skipper. So this is actually a non-native butterfly um, that's come over from Europe and has really established itself here in North America. These are the ones that at the right time of the year in July, um, you can see them by the thousands. They, they love roadside flowers. Um, there's probably hit lots of them with your car. They're, they're everywhere at the peak time of the year. But there's also a lot of um, other native skippers that can be found among the masses of European skippers. This one is a leaf skipper. It's I mean, the skippers themselves are really tiny, but this one I think is a little bit smaller and a slightly different design. This one, common branded skipper, it has some uh, unique brands on its wings. I think that's how it got its name. And this is one of my favorite butterflies, the Arcadian hair streak. Just the nice little splash of orange there on the gray. So, how to find butterflies. So in the spring, what you need is 10 degrees Celsius and sunlight. That's when the first um, butterflies will emerge for the year. Morning cloak, Compton tortoiseshell are the big two that uh, overwinter as adults locally and that's when they will start to emerge. And then once you get into spring and um, summer, then pretty much every day is over 10 degrees and most days have sunlight. So um, butterflies will be out in full force and they can be found just about anywhere, but obviously they feed on flowers. So if you have a good patch of flowers somewhere, there's bound to be butterflies. They like flying around open fields because it's nice and warm. There are species that specialize in wetlands and forests and gravel roads are especially good. Um, on a nice hot day, they like resting on the road to uh, either feed on things that are on the road or um, to warm up and those gravel roads often have a variety of roadside um, flowers that they feed on. So gravel roads are a good place to walk down and uh, find some butterflies. But really anywhere you go, you're bound to see them. If you really want to see more butterflies around your house, um, you should create a butterfly garden. So every butterfly species is different. Um, they prefer different types of flowers, different specific species. So if you do your research with uh, what but kind of butterflies you want to attract, then you can figure out which species you should plant. Um, when it comes to caterpillars, they forage on specific species. Obviously, the big example is monarch caterpillars feed on milkweed. So if you have lots of milkweed around, I'm sure you'll have lots of monarchs. And if you're planting, just make sure you're planting native species because 
that's obviously the best. Um, we don't want non-natives um, in your gar in our gardens. Um, uh, they obviously like sun, so you know don't plant your butterfly garden in the middle of a dense conifer forest. Make sure there's sunny open areas. Again, gravel or some bare rocks are a good idea to have them some places for them to warm up. Um, what I've read online is that some sort of water source is good that will help um, you know keep the butterflies happy and sticking around. And if you leave your leaves unraked, um, that will provide good overwintering habitat for the butterflies and uh, they might stick around and be out there in the spring. So some sources for learning more about butterflies. Um, this is probably the best book for um, like field guide for learning how to ID butterflies in Ontario. If you're not in Ontario, I'm sure you're um, your location must have some sort of field guide, but this one is published by the um, Royal Ontario Museum. It's got a ton of great photos. I have a copy of it there myself, and I highly recommend it. Um, if you're looking for distribution and, um, you know, data on where and when butterflies have been seen, the Toronto Entomologist Association has the Ontario Butterfly Atlas, which is basically what they do is they collect data from all variety of sources and they put it all together in one big database. So this is the go-to resource for finding out um, distribution based on sightings. And if you're wondering how often a species gets seen somewhere, go to the Ontario Butterfly Atlas. So this is the default map that shows all the observations. As you see, most of the observations are in populated areas, southern Ontario, then, um, you know, kind of our area, and you can actually see in the north where the highways are, Highway 11, Highway 17, just because that's where people travel. And no doubt that there's butterflies all across the province, it's just there's, the north end is highly inaccessible, so not a lot of data from there. If you pick certain species, so here is monarch, you can get an idea of where their records are. And if you zoom right in, this one I changed to Northern Pearly Eye, which is a butterfly that tends to like the forests. You can actually zoom right in and click on the squares and it'll give you um, information about where that data came from. So I already mentioned iNaturalist, but um, this is another good resource. It's a little, um, it's pretty user friendly. If you have a photo, you just upload it through the website or app on your phone. And this is a collection of all the butterfly species that have been seen in Algoma. Um, so you can check that out. It's uh, easy to search if you're on the iNaturalist website. And then eButterfly. I haven't really, I've used it slightly, but um, not a lot. But if you're familiar with eBird, it's basically the butterfly version of eBird. So same kind of thing, they have maps on there where you can check out all the sightings that um, have been submitted to you butterfly. Um, this is here for kind of the central Algoma area. My screen's not, there we go. And uh, what you do is you um, submit, you know, how many of which species you've seen, where you saw them, and then that data goes into the database. So now moths. Um, these, I don't have as good of photos of moths. Typically, since they come out at night, they are uh, hard to photograph. This one is a hooked tooth moth. Um, I get these fairly often right this time of the year at my house. This is a modest sphinx. This is you know, pretty brown, but this guy was actually pretty big, like not quite the size of my, maybe about the size of the palm of my hand. It was sitting on uh, the Kensington Conservation Center door one day when I came into work. Uh, crocus geometer moth. Um, this is actually a genus. You, there's a couple different species, but they're uh, pretty hard to, or impossible to identify two species without dissecting them. 
but they're bright yellow and they actually come out during the day and probably are often mistaken as butterflies. Blackberry looper moth, this cute little green um, moth. You can see his furry antenna there fairly well in this photo. Confused haploa moth. Um, sigmoid prominent. These guys, uh, again, you can see the, the furry antenna there. And they're kind of a weird shape when they are resting on a surface. They're more kind of like domey shaped than flat. Chickweed geometer moth, another one of the more prettier moths with its pink and uh, yellow colors. So aspen serpentine leaf miner moth. So there's no actual moth in this photo, but we can see the evidence that's left behind from the caterpillar that eats away at trembling aspen leaves. They leave these wavy, cool designs throughout the leaf feeding on it. So if you or anywhere where there's a bunch of uh, trembling aspen, take a look at the leaves a um, bit later on, midsummer or so, and I'm sure you're bound to see these designs in a couple of the leaves. Um, Parthenence tiger moth. There's a bunch of different species of tiger moth. They uh, all are kind of look similar to this with the nice um, reddish orange underside of the wings. Straight-lined Plygodus moth. This is, was a new one for me that I saw just the other night at my house. Black and yellow lichen moth. Um, this one was, even though it's on some, um, is that pine there? Um, I saw this on Coatsworth Island, which is one of TKC's new nature preserves, but there's, it was right above a bunch of lichen that was growing on the rocks. So aptly named, I guess. And the Isabella tiger moth, and what this is it in caterpillar form, which is often referred to as a woolly bear. Um, I'm, if you haven't seen one of these running across your driveway or across the road in front of you, I'm sure you will sometime soon. They can be all throughout the spring, summer, fall months, they can be seen scurrying along and eventually they become the Isabella tiger moth. Oh, and I forgot to change this caption. Um, and I forget the name of this one, but this was a cool looking moth that I had at my house the other night as well. So in terms of field guides, the Peterson Field Guide to Moths of Northeastern North America is really the best field guide out there for this area. Um, it's got all the moths in it, a nice glossary to easily um, flick your way through the 3,000 plus moths that are um, shown in it. Unfortunately, my dog got a hold of this one, so the corners are a little chewed up, but uh, it's still functional, so that's good. Um, how to find moths. Basically, turn on a light at night. Um, they're moths, as uh, most people know, are attracted to lights. So if you turn on your porch light or you set up a flashlight, um, you're bound to attract some moths in on a nice warm summer night. If you set up a sheet and have a light shining up against it, that will give the moths somewhere to um, cling on to so that you can then take their picture or look at them. Um, black lights or iridescent lights actually work better than your, our standard um, you know, porch light or flashlight kind of thing that they're, the moths are attracted to those kind of lights more. Um, there's all kinds of setups that you can buy online that, you know, attract more moths. So it all depends on how much money you're willing to spend, but um, it can be pretty simple to attract a wide variety of moths. And um, I'm sure some of you might have seen in 2018, moth memes were really popular on, on the internet and that's the moth from it there. Um, I find them pretty funny. If, I'm sure you will too if you've seen them before. Um, but other than, you know, turning on a light and attracting moths, basically you can find them in any habitat type, um, anywhere you go. 
during the day, there's bound to be some moths somewhere. So again, there's a, on a naturalist, there is um, a group for moths within the Algoma district. And I'm sure your local area will have its own group for moths as well. And um, National Moth Week, if you're interested, is coming up July 17th to the 25th this year. And uh, if you go to nationalmothweek.org, there's all kinds of information and resources about moths. It's, uh, I participated in the last year and it's pretty fun. So that's all I have for now. Hopefully that was a good introduction to the world of butterflies and moths. Um, here's my contact info in case you um, wish to get a hold of me for more information about butterflies and moths or for anything about TKC in general. I've uh, recorded this presentation this evening. So if you um, came in late or would like to rewatch it or send it to your friends, um, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, just search the Kensington Conservancy on YouTube and you should be able to come bring it up. I probably won't get it up until some point tomorrow though. So at this time, I'm gonna stop my share and open it up to any questions that anyone may have. If you have anything, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask away and I'll try my best to answer. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, we've been collecting um, uh, butterflies of late and uh, one of the most difficult things is obviously trying to like the, uh, for example, the whites, the mustard white or the, uh, the cabbage white. To identify the suckers, you got to get them in your hand. You can't do it. Yeah. It's not like picking up a um, uh, morning cloak or something. So what's the best tech? I know we, we've done handling the animals, but it just seems you need to almost get a photograph of it and let the thing go. And I put it in plastic bags and photograph it, but the resolution is not the best. Is you got a, a technique for holding them down, if, if you will, while you're trying to make the identification? Yeah, see, I honestly have never really got into the catching them. I, okay. I just have my camera handy and if I'm able to get a photo, then great. And most of the time they get away without getting a photo. So I, uh, I, don't, I don't have any right. recommendations on handling them. Um, I, I can, uh, yeah. I know someone who does have information on that, that I can direct you to. I can shoot you an email after with his contact info if you want. Yeah. Well, let me do some homework and see if I can find out. We've got a couple of friends who are into it rather heavy down the Halliburton area. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, but, okay. I'll pass. Thank you. Okay. Carter, it's yep. Tom. What, um, what most uh, do they feed on, the moths versus the butterflies? Um, see, I don't know a ton about the biology side of moths. I'm just starting to get into the game of identifying them. But I think it depends on the species they'll feed on. I think mostly plant matter. Um, but okay. I've seen them feeding on like dead things before too. So it uh, might depend on the species, but at this time, I don't know a ton about their moth feeding habits. Hi, Carter, this is Becky. Hey. Um, I just have a question about, um, the overwintering, you said about like not raking up the leaves um, for them. So what species or do you know of uh, butterflies or moths actually do overwinter here in, in like yeah. our area? So in terms of butterflies, the most two common ones are morning cloaks and Compton tortoise shells. Um, I believe most of the commas overwinter as adults as well. 
except I don't know how, I think most that's more Southern Ontario, if I'm not mistaken, like we do get some overwintering here, but um, so like green comma, Eastern comma, um, gray comma and question mark butterfly. I think Milbert's tortoiseshell as well. I think those are the main ones as butterflies that overwinter as adults. And in terms of moths, I, I don't know. There's just so many moths to keep track of that um, I haven't figured out yet which ones overwinter and which ones don't. Okay, just curious. I knew about the monarchs traveling all the way from, from Mexico and I guess, yeah. so there's some butterflies that do and others that stick around here all winter. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that. So yeah, there are some that migrate, but then some will overwinter as um, caterpillars and then emerge in the spring as butterflies. So not all of them migrate either. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, I don't think so. I'm not hearing anything else. So I hope you all enjoyed and learned a little bit about um, some of the butterflies and moths that we have in our area. Um, again, if you're interested in learning more, um, just give me a shout and I can help you out as much as I can or direct you to some resources for questions I can't help you with. So that said, have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Carter. You're welcome. Thank you, Carter. I think that was very helpful. There have been a few chats here about putting them in the refrigerator so that if you can catch one, it'll slow it down and then you can get a picture or, or whatever. Um, there were a few chats on that if everybody wants to check them. <clears throat> Thanks, Carter. Okay. Thanks, Alice. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.